Welcome to another Achieve CE presentation. Today we're going to talk about issues pharmacy professionals must address for patient safety. Hi, I'm Professor Pete Crackle. I'm an adjunct assistant professor of pharmacology at St. Francis University in Loretto, Pennsylvania. There I teach pharmacology to the physician assistant class, about 55 kids in my class, and I teach them how to prescribe and hopefully how to prescribe with great accuracy. Let's review today's learning objectives. The pharmacist's learning objectives are to review the pillars of safe medication administration and the definitions of medication errors. We will describe the common types of medication errors and their potential consequences. We will identify the roles of various governing bodies and state laws in promoting and ensuring medication safety. We'll discuss the best practices in preventing medication errors. Our technician learning objectives will be to differentiate medication errors and adverse events. We will describe common causes of medication errors. We'll identify various ways to avoid medication errors in the community pharmacy. And we will describe the role of pharmacy technicians, your important role in preventing medication errors. I'm Peter Crackle. I have nothing to disclose financially with regards to this program. I've taught pharmacology at St. Francis University for the past 16 years. I have also worked in a community pharmacy for over 40 years. I've worked independent community pharmacy with the exception of the first six months of my career where I worked for a national chain. I've also precepted 65 student pharmacists from a variety of universities, namely the University of Pittsburgh School of Pharmacy, my alma mater, as well as Duquesne University, West Virginia University, Dewville University, and Lake Erie College of Medicine. I have also trained and worked with numerous technicians over the years. Been doing this for over 40 years. Well, let's take a look at some definitions, what the governing bodies tell us. And a medication error is defined as the National Coordinating Council says it's any preventable event that may cause harm or lead to inappropriate medication use or patient harm while the medication is in the control of the healthcare professional, the patient, or the consumer. That sounds like it covers about everything. An adverse drug event is any response to a drug which is noxious or unintended and which occurs at doses normally used in humans for the prophylaxis, diagnosis, or therapy of a disease. Let's review the six rights of patients and some tips as far as when we are getting that type of information and let's talk about those rights. The first of all, the right patient and that begins with the date of birth. Always verify with the date of birth the patient's identity and I tell my technicians this, don't even come and ask me a question about a patient unless you have their name written out and spelled on a piece of paper with a date of birth on it. That's how we know we're at the right patient. Right medication. Check the NDC code, and we'll talk a lot about national drug codes, what they mean, and how beneficial they can be in verifying the appropriate medication. The right dose, that's pretty much the pharmacist's responsibility, and the truth is we have a lot of software that's going to catch that. Uh, just the other day, one of my pharmacy technicians came over to me with a question about a Symbacort inhaler, and they were billing it for a quantity of 120, and it was not going through. Well, they were looking at the 120 puffs rather than the 10.2 grams, which is how you bill the Symbacort inhaler. So it kept coming up as an overdose and overdose and overdose. Once I looked at it, I said, oh, the quantity is too high. So most of the time, the insurance companies are going to make sure that you obviously are using the right dose. The right route. Always explain non-oral routes. Most patients are going to assume everything in a bottle is going to be given to them oral. So make sure you explain, especially sublingual. If you're looking at the buprenorphine products, which are all sublingual, make sure you explain or have the pharmacist explain to the patient exactly what that means. The right time. 
pharmacist can discuss with a patient the best times to take the medication. Let's talk about rosuvastatin versus pravastatin. Well, pravastatin and simvastatin are two of the older statins, and those two older statins ideally are dosed at bedtime. It's not such a big deal, but most of the time you'll see uh, pharmacists telling patients with statins to take them at bedtime. Whereas atorvastatin and rosuvastatin, those two are very long statins, and they can be dosed any time of the day. I tell my patient, if you take it at bedtime, that might help. It might be of benefit. But the truth of the matter is, if you're missing a bedtime dose, that doesn't do anything at all. Move it to the morning, no matter what statin you're taking. And the right documentation. The prescription is supported by the correct documentation and consult references if unfamiliar. Well, what can happen when a medication error occurs? Well, we can have serious harmful results of a medication error, and it can range all the way up to death. Life-threatening situations, a patient may end up so sick that they have to go to the hospital. I'll tell you an incident that I know of locally where that happened. Disability or even a birth defect if it's given a teratogenic medication is given to a woman. Well, let's talk about the numbers of errors. There's 1.5 million medication errors occur each year, and that's a rate of 171 errors per hour, increased from a rate of 1.09 per 100,000 people in 2000 to 2.28 per 100,000 people in 2012. What do you think is responsible for causing that almost doubling of a rate? I have my thoughts too. Let's talk about some famous quotes about errors, then we can extrapolate this to medication errors. Mistakes are a fact of life. It's the response to the error that counts. How do we respond when an error happens? Are we pointing fingers? Are we blaming? Or are we trying to figure out a way to make sure that error doesn't happen again? An intelligent person is never afraid or ashamed to find errors in his understanding of things. And my favorite comes from dear Eleanor Roosevelt. That would be Franklin Delano Roosevelt's wife. Learn from the mistakes of others. You can't live long enough to make all of them yourself. Well, let's talk about the most common dispensing medication errors. First of all, let's talk about the incorrect medication. The medication was processed wrong, say, at the data entry step. Potassium citrate, 10 milliequivalents versus potassium chloride, 10 milliequivalents. That's a big one. That's an easy one. I have seen that done. What would be a good way to resolve that error? Well, ideally, it would be nice if when it is being prescribed, the prescription would have read uracit K, 10 milliequivalents versus K dur 10 milliequivalents. If a technician or the pharmacist would have typed in uracit K and then the potassium citrate came up, might be a less likelihood that the data entry would have occurred incorrectly. What I will even do when I have a potassium citrate prescription, and I have a couple patients on it, I will have the SIG code written out, and then in parentheses, I will write uracite K 10 milli equivalents, just so it's something else to take a look at. Wrong dosage strength or dosage form. What about amitriptyline 10 versus amitriptyline 100? And after a lot of data entry, those two can run together. I see it happen a whole lot with vitamin D. Vitamin D is not going to hurt anybody, but I'll see vitamin D 5,000 versus vitamin D 50,000. That's why that comma is so important. Miscalculating a dose. We don't do that a whole lot in the community pharmacy situation that some doctor will call and say, hey, calculate this dose for me. But very common in the hospitals, most likely to occur in hospital situations with chemotherapy, aminoglycoside, and especially vancomycin dosing. One of my physician friends said to me, thank God for hospital pharmacists. She says, all I have to do is order vanc appropriately, and that's all they have to do. The doctor sits back, the hospital pharmacist does all the work, and the dose is calculated, and all of the monitoring is taken care of. 
What about failing to identify drug interactions and contraindications? We see a lot of times these drug interactions occur. Uh, things like you'll see a Prozac 20 and a Trazodone 50, and that'll come up as a level two interaction. And the pharmacist will look at it and say, ah, it's not a big deal. And it's not because both of those are low dose. But what about venlafaxine 150 and Zybox? Remember Zybox, linezolid, has a lot of monoamine oxidase and serotonin properties to it. Unfortunately, I know of an incident that happened in the state of Pennsylvania where a patient died in a hospital that was on venlafaxine 150 when she came into the hospital, was given her dose every day, and the physician prescribed Zybox, and the patient went into serotonin syndrome, became febrile, and died. So I have a lot more respect when I see a Zybox prescription as well. And the wrong patient. It can happen on data entry, we're aware of that, but the biggest problem can be the wrong patient at checkout. Patients I have seen over the years will just agree to anything. You know, my name is Jim Smith, and so you go up to him, you say, this is a prescription here for John Jones, and yep, that's me. You can't do that. We always tell the patient, give us your date of birth. It's not that we want to quiz anybody to see if they know when their kids' birthdays were or their wives' birthdays were, but it's a good way to verify. Two-step verification. Tell me the patient's name and their date of birth. I don't know their date of birth. Tell me something else that's on this label. Well, yeah, they live on Teresa Street in St. Mary's, Pennsylvania. Okay, we have the right patient. We have the right crackle. The plexiglass barriers that we are, have all installed in our pharmacies now to uh, protect us against a variety of germs. And patients will crowd around the cash register. There's lots of chatter and noise. The patient frequently just does not hear you. They agree to it and they walk out the door with the wrong medication. Always do a two-step verification. And that is something that your cashiers can do. I always tell my staff that is one mistake that I cannot be responsible for in the pharmacy is if a cashier gives the patient the wrong bag with the prescription in it. Well, let's talk about pharmacist errors. Well, we have mechanical errors, you know, dispensing the wrong drug, the wrong dosage form, the, the potassium 10 versus the uh, potassium citrate 10, the wrong dosage form, probably not such a big deal. Wrong directions are a big deal. Wrong quantity, strength, and dose. These are all mechanical errors. And sometimes when the pharmacist is called upon to make a judgmental error, that can happen as well. We can have improper or no counseling. I remember reading somewhere, and I really couldn't find it as a reference, that you can eliminate 70 to 80 percent of dispensing errors by simply reading the prescription label to the patient, even calling that counseling, improper or no counseling, or failure to detect drug interactions like that Zybox interaction with the venlafaxine, and inadequate drug use review. Also some judgmental errors, and I saw this happen uh, to a friend of our family's, a uh, patient was sent home on IV vancomycin, and it was through like one of those nursing agencies uh, to follow him up after hospital care. And he was given IV vancomycin for osteomyelitis in his fourth toe. His fourth toe was amputated because he's a type 2 diabetic. And unfortunately, nobody ordered any renal follow-up. He was feeling ill. This doctor did some blood work. And he said, your kidney function is terrible. What's going on? And here, no one had followed up with any of the monitoring parameters, especially the renal parameters for vancomycin therapy. Remember when you were a kid in third grade and you came home with a 95 on your test or a 99 on your test and how excited you were? In our profession, 99% is dismal, I would have to say. 95% is probably unacceptable. What about 99.9%? .9 so this is all a, a, a very practical application of many years of labor. Let's do a math problem featuring Professor Pete. Let's assume, and it's a good, really solid assumption, I work four days a week for 48 weeks out of a year. So let's just say 192 days per year I would work. In those 192 days, I've worked for 40 years. So that's 7,680 days that I've worked. 
So we take the 7,680 days times, let's just say I did 200 prescriptions a day. Earlier on in my career, when we opened a couple new stores, we didn't do 200 a day. Later on in my career, 300 a day was very commonplace. Again, I've worked independent community pharmacy, and I'm sure many of you that are working for change are saying, 200 a day, that would be a day off for me. Well, let's just use that number. And we run those numbers and we see that in my 40-year career, it would be reasonable to say I have adjudicated or looked over or verified 1,536,000 prescriptions. And let's say I did it with great accuracy, 99.9% .9 accuracy. That still would be 1,536 errors. So some of you folks that have worked chain pharmacy for, you know, 20, 30 years might very well have filled over a million and a half prescriptions yourself. When you got a minute or two, grab a pencil and paper, certainly not during this presentation, grab a pencil and paper, calculate it out. I think you will be amazed how many millions of prescriptions some of us seasoned clinicians have filled. So let's talk about verification. And one of the rules that I have at the pharmacy I work at, if a patient calls and says, hey, my pills don't look right, what, what, what should I do? Uh, are these the right pills? I'm worried about this. And I tell my staff, that is a question I want to answer. I know of a situation that happened in my hometown not at the pharmacy I worked at, thank heavens, a patient was taking amitriptyline 10 milligrams. They called in for a refill and amitriptyline 100 milligrams was dispensed in the bottle. The patient called twice, two different occasions, once on a Friday and once on a Monday, to verify that the tablets look different. She said the tablets don't look the same, they look bigger. And the tech said, oh, generics are always changing, don't worry about it, you're going to be fine. So after a couple days, she started taking the new prescription, which was actually the 100 milligram tablets, and she talked to her daughter on the phone. And her daughter says, mom, you don't sound good, you've not been drinking, have you? And she says, no, I, I'm just really, really sick and can you take me to the hospital? So daughter takes the patient to the emergency room. A nurse looked at the bottle of pills and says, well, they look all right to me. The patient has a stroke. Later on that day, the pills were identified by a student who was studying healthcare and looked it up in a drug database. Something as simple as typing in on Google, round pill with the tablet markings on them, could have prevented this whole tragedy from occurring. So the technician two times said the pills were all right. The nurse said they were all right in the emergency room. And it wasn't until a healthcare student looked it up in a drug database, found out that it was not amitriptyline 10, but it was amitriptyline 100 which is one of uh, the many rants that I have. Many of you do know that I write a magazine article for one of the pharmacy magazines, and this was something that I called out oh, a couple years ago. Why can't we have standards for pill labeling and identification? Isn't this a beautiful example? Look at that purple and gray capsule. It says right on it, Omeprazole 40. Now, if you were taking Omeprazole 20, which wouldn't cause any harm, I get that. But if you look at Omeprazole, you would know looking at your capsule that this was Omeprazole 40 instead of Kremer's Urban brand, a KU-136. What is that? Is that Omeprazole? Is that amoxicillin? It could be any of those because there's really no solid markings on the capsule that the patient can interpret. Prior to 1995, there were no federal guidelines for addressing imprint data on solid dosage forms of prescription drug products. And just the other day when I was working, we get this prescription for generic Seroquel, XR200, and it said on it, the prescription itself, under the description for the drug, it said intagliated. And I said, what on earth does the word intagliated mean? Intagliated, I thought, I've been doing this for 40 years. I'm very good with Latin abbreviations, but I have never heard the term intagliated. Fortunately, we were able to ask Dr. Google what the term intagliated mean, and this is just some pharmacy trivial that you can throw around. It's an archaic term for engraved on the surface. The origin is the late 18th century from the Italian word intagliato, meaning engraved. It's the past participle of intagliare, meaning 
to cut. It actually said entangliated, meaning that the pills were identified. Well, let's take a look at different definitions and types of medication errors. The definition of harm is impairment of the physical, emotional, psychological, or structure of the body and or pain therefrom. Monitoring to observe or record relevant physiological or psychological signs. Intervention may include a change in therapy or active medical surgical treatment. An intervention necessary to sustain life is cardiovascular or CPR, defibrillation, or any kind of respiratory support. So let's take a look at this wheel and just briefly touch on what some of these potential errors are. Uh, category A is circumstances or events that have the capacity to cause an error. Uh, category B, an error occurred, but the error didn't reach the patient. An error of omission does not reach the patient. Hey, we caught it at the last minute. Category C, an error occurred that reached the patient but didn't cause harm. Category D requires monitoring to confirm that, the that there is no harm. You can read the rest of these categories, E, F, G, H, and I is an error occurred that may have contributed or resulted in the patient's death. So we have lots of categories of errors that can occur all the way from it could have happened to it had a lethal outcome. Well, can the FDA help? You know, we always look to the government for solutions. The FDA monitors all prescription products. Every name, every capsule appearance, every tablet appearance, every imprint on every tablet or capsule is governed by the FDA. So can the FDA help us out? Well, my humble opinion, I don't know that we can rely on them too much either once I show you the case that I have. The proposed proprietary or brand names to minimize confusion among drug names. With the help of simulated prescriptions and computerized monitor models, the FDA determines the acceptability of proposed proprietary names to minimize medication errors associated with the product name confusion. So we all remember us older pharmacists, the abbreviation DPH, right? diphenylhydantoin, dilantin. Do we all remember DOSS? We know that that's docusate or colase, but it's really dioctyl sodium sulfosuccinate. So these abbreviations were uh, became part of the language because of the long name. So the FDA kind of helped rename products. So let's see how they did. The first one I remember was in the early 1990s. It was called LOSEC, L-O-S-E-C, 20 milligrams. Well, because of the confusion between LOSIC-20 once a day in the morning and LASIK-20 on a poorly written prescription, there was great confusion, so the LOSEC name later had to be changed to Prilosec. How about Amaryl versus Reminil? Amaryl, of course, is a sulfonylurea, second-generation sulfonylurea, and Reminil is for Alzheimer's disease. Reminil later had to change its name to Razadine because doctors were writing for Reminil 4, sloppy handwriting, and it was being filled with Amaryl 4. And what about Berlinta versus Berlintex? That's a relatively new one, and Berlintex had to change its name to Trilintex because of the potential for confusion. So, can the FDA help? Container labels to help Healthcare providers and consumers select the right drug product. If the drug is made in multiple strengths, say 5, 10, and 25, the labels on those containers should be easy to differentiate, and they are not, as we'll all agree. If you don't believe me, go over to your shelves and pull off an Aripiprazole 2, an Aripiprazole 5, an Aripiprazole 10, and an Aripiprazole 20, and without a magnifying glass, be able to see the differences ridiculous that we don't have different colored labels for that. The label design may use different colors to identify the strength or even large bold numbers or letters. My favorite is Greenstone Pharmaceuticals brand of Cabergoline. Get a bottle of Greenstone's Cabergoline and try to read Cabergoline without a magnifying glass. 
prescribing and patient information to ensure that the directions for prescribing, preparing are clear and easy to read. BID, TID, QID, QD, QOD, OD. What do all of those abbreviations mean? And you know, even with electronic prescribing, we still have a lot of doctors that are using those Latin abbreviations in the SIG code rather than clicking on the potential drop down menus that they have where they could say, take one tablet twice a day, take one tablet every other day. I even remember a doctor that used to write OD, meaning one tablet daily. And when they first had computer databases, one pharmacist uh, filled a prescription that said T1T space OD, take one tablet daily in the right eye is what the label said. Well, let's look at some more brand name confusion. Again, some ridiculous things that we see that could have easily been prevented by the FDA. You get a prescription for Diltiazem, 120 milligrams. What are you going to fill it with? Well, it depends. The potential brand names and an older pharmacist like me that's been doing this a while, I remember when Cardizem CD first came out as the 30, the 60, and the 120 milligram tablets. I remember when then Cardizem SR became available uh, because it was dosed twice a day. I remember then when Cardizem CD came out, the capsules once a day. And when they were losing the patent on that, they changed it to Cardizem LA, 120 milligram tablets. So if it says Cardizem CD, we know that's dosed once a day. If it says Cardizem 120, is that the tablets three to four times a day, the SR twice a day, or the LA once a day? Again, why all this product confusion? Because the names CD, SR, LA, XR, ER are not governed by the FDA. They mean virtually nothing. When we look at uh, drugs like bupropion, XL150, bupropion, SR150, a lot of confusion with these sustained release and extended release products. And let us not forget our good friend Divalprolex, Prolex, SR and ER. Well, that's not SR, it's DR, delayed release and extended release. So who names this stuff? Well, let's talk about that Depakote versus Depakote ER. That really wasn't a big deal for most of us until the generics came out. Now you have generics and you have Divalprox DR versus ER. The DR is the delayed release, which was the plain Depakote, which was the seizure medication. Whereas Divalprox ER, the extended release, those are the silver tablets, generally speaking, uh, is for migraine headache as well as bipolar disease. How about amlodipine versus amiloride? Very easy to confuse those two five milligram doses. What about Celebrex versus Celexa? You type in CELE2O, depending on your database, it might be Celebrex 200, it may be Celexa 20. And what about Adderall versus Adderall LA? And what about dimenhydrinate versus diphenhydramine? Again, all of these approved names by the FDA that cause a great source of confusion. So I'm working on a bench one day and I get a prescription from the emergency department. Patient brings in a hand pa delivered paper prescription. It's typewritten out. It came off of a computer. So they have this sheet of paper. They hand it to me and I start typing in the patient's name and everything and I stop and ambrosentin five milligrams never dispensed ambrosentin before hmm better look this one up so I look it up and it's used for pulmonary arterial hypertension and it says take one tablet at bedtime for three nights you know pulmonary arterial hypertension is a long lasting disease you don't cure it in three nights and the usual dose was one tablet daily so I struggled with this and I thought, I just don't know what this is. And for only three days, do I buy a whole bottle? It's a specialty drug. Who do I? I'll wait till the patient comes in. So the patient comes in a little bit later and says, hey, is my prescription ready? I said, Mrs. Jones, we've got a little problem with this Ambrosentin prescription that you brought in. It says one tablet at bedtime for three nights. And I showed it to her where it said Ambrosentin. And she says, no, 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 no. That's not what I want. I need that sleeping pill, Ambien. Dead silence. Ambien, 
I said, this clearly says ambrosentin. So she says, no, no, the doctor wanted me to have a sleeping pill. And I told him I did well on Ambien. So he gave me three nights worth it. So I called up to the emergency room and told them, you know, that I have this paper prescription clearly written out for ambrosentin. Oh, doc just must have keyed in AMB5, one at bedtime for three nights and didn't double verify it. Elmyron, one of my favorite stories that I share with my student pharmacists, as well as my PAs. This one, my wife caught. She fills a prescription for Elmiron, one capsule, three times a day. And this drug is used for interstitial cystitis, has to be taken three times a day. It has some side effects like hair loss, and it has to be used long term. So she got the prescription ready and went out and talked to the person. Remember how important I said patient counseling was. So Denise goes out and says, hey, I want to tell you a little bit about this Elmiron. You're not going to get immediate benefits from it. You're going to take a capsule three times a day. It's useful for your bladder irritation and bladder burning. Also, your diet might have an effect. And Elisa says, stop, 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 stop right there. She says, I don't have anything wrong with my bladder. I have anemia. My doctor wrote a prescription for iron, and that's what I want filled. And Denise brings the paper over. She says, it clearly says here, Elmiron. And so she called the doctor and the doctor says, oh, I was just scrolling down the menu uh, looking for iron or ferrous sulfate. And this one came up first. And I, I thought it was an easily eliminated iron. It's not an iron supplement. And Denise says, no, it's actually for interstitial cystitis. He says, thank you very much for the save. Change it to ferrous sulfate, 325, three times a day. I appreciate you calling. As I say, sometimes the FDA is not going to help. All right, let's take a look at some more challenges we have as pharmacists. And again, this is not a lecture to bust on the FDA in Washington, but just to show you some of the challenges we all have as pharmacists. Yes, the FDA does approve these names. So I'll say to my student pharmacist, hey, Skippy, what's the active ingredient in Lotrimin? They'll say, well, clotrimazole, you know, they studied this real well. So I'll go out and I'll grab a Lotrimin AF powder off the shelf and say, I don't know. Does this say clotrimazole? It says myconazole on this one. And then I'll pull up the Lotrimin Ultra and say, this says butenafine. And then I will pull up the Lotrimin Daily Prevention and I'll say, this one says tolmaptate. Of course, we know in the original Lotrimin product, clotrimazole was the active ingredient. But the FDA allows Lotrimin Ultra to be uh, budenafine, Lotrimin Jock Itch Spray to be myconazole, Lotrimin AF Foot Powder to be myconazole, and Lotrimin Daily Prevention to be tolnaftate. Again, cross-branding. Dulcolax Tablets. Ask any student pharmacist. Everybody knows it's by Zacadel, right? Well, if it's Dulcolax Soft Chews, and this is being advertised on TV. Saw a commercial the other day. That's magnesium hydroxide, 1,200 milligrams. What's in Dulcolax? Dulcolax Pink Softener is Docusate 100 milligrams. So what's in Dulcolax? Well, it depends. It could be by Zacadel. It could be magnesium hydroxide, and it could be Docusate. When I was doing a, my GI lecture at St. Francis, I would tell the students, and make sure if a kid has any kind of a fever or is under age 18, that you never prescribe Pepto-Bismol. I know everybody likes to give Pepto-Bismol for GI distress, and a lot of times it's a viral enteritis. Any type of viral enteritis, don't give a kid Pepto-Bismol if, if they're under 18. Hand went up. Mr. Crackle. what is in children's Pepto? And I said, ah, glad you asked. What's in children's Pepto? calcium carbonate. What's in monostat? Myconazole, right? Unless it's monostat one, which is teoconazole, the once a day formulation. Even Allegra, good old fexofenadine, the topical Allegra cream is diphenhydramine. Unisom is doxylamine. How frequently do we grab a box of Unisom along with vitamin B6 for a patient who can't afford diclegis? A lot of times they're OBGYN will say to us, uh, you know, you give them a box of Unisom and, and give them some B6, they can't afford the diclegis. So you go out and you talk to the patient, which Unisom, if they pull it off the shelf, they're going to grab the sleep gels virtually every time. That's diphenhydramine. Not a big deal, but it's not what the doctor ordered. Diphenhydramine is pregnancy category B. 
doxylamine is pregnancy category A. Well, what about flonase? Flonase is fluticasone per pionate, and we use lots of fluticasone per pionate in the back. Well, out front, it's the same as what we have in the back. You remember Veramist? Well, Veramist used to be in the back. Now that's up front, and they changed its name to Flonase. Sense of mist, which is fluticasone fewer rate, a different compound, and fluticasone sense of mist is alcohol free and unscented. The problem with that is, is if their doctor says get some flonase sense of mist, and they say, oh okay, and they come to the pharmacy and they see a flonase on the shelf and they buy it and they say, oh the stuff tasted terrible, the doctor was wrong, it's because they picked the wrong flonase. They should have picked the sense of mist, which is alcohol free and unscented. And what about Advil? We all know Advil is ibuprofen, except Advil dual action is ibuprofen plus acetaminophen. Well, who else can help us pharmacists since we don't seem to be getting a whole lot of benefit uh, or help from the FDA? The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has two agencies that govern medication-related errors. Of course, the Food Drug Administration, and we said, man, they don't seem to be helping us out a whole lot, and the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. We also still have the United States Pharmacopeia. It's the organization does its by setting safety, quality, and efficacy standards for meds, prescription, and OTC. At one time, Pennsylvania law, and early on in my career, required us to have a copy of the current USP, the United States Pharmacopeia. And we argued for many years that that is a reference for industry. There is very, very little chance that I'm going to be doing the analysis of digoxin tablets in my pharmacy to make sure that they're efficacious. Fortunately, that went by the wayside. But at one time, we would buy the United States Pharmacopeia. We would leave it in its plastic wrapper just to show any inspector that we never even opened the thing because it's of no value. We also have then the National Coordinating Council, the NCC. That was established in 1995 to promote medication safety through open communication about medication errors, increased awareness of medication errors, and the implementation of error prevention strategies. The Institute for Safe Medication Practices, the ISMP, and we frequently get flyers from them. This seems to be like a very solid organization, which will give us some good tips. That was established in 1975 to promote safe medication use and medication error prevention. The ISMP manages the medication errors reporting program, which tracks the causes of medication errors. It identifies erroneously used medications and provide strategies for preventing future errors. And that's something that I think most of us pharmacists will have a great deal of appreciation for. We see when errors happen, but what can be done to prevent them? If the lady with the amitriptyline 100 versus the amitriptyline 10 had a tablet that said AMIT, 100 mg on it and then maybe the manufacturer's numbers on the back that error and that stroke probably wouldn't have happened because she could have easily identified it and that's one of the things we want to talk throughout this program and presentation isn't pointing fingers it's coming up with solutions to minimize the potential for errors and finally my hospital pharmacist i'm sure you sweat every time you see these six letters in a row j h JCAHCO, the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations, who will come into your pharmacy with the white gloves on and make sure that you're following every possible rule known to mankind. Let's look at some numbers from the Food and Drug Administration. According to the FDA estimates, at least one person dies every day, and approximately 1.3 million are injured annually as a result of medication errors. These errors can occur at any point in prescribing. From the prescriber to handing the bag to the patient, there is error potential. The FDA conducted a study that found the following were the most common causes of fatal medication errors. The incorrect medication dose, the incorrect medication, the incorrect method of administration, 
Some other common causes of medication errors include inadequate communication between pharmacists, doctors, nurses, and nurse practitioners. Is there anything worse than leaving a voicemail for a pharmacist? You know, in today's world, you know, our computers kind of take care of that voicemail thing. You usually have to put on a set of headphones. I wear hearing aids. So my hearing aids, I have to take them out, put the headphones on, listen to the message a couple times. They usually read it really fast and make sure you get an office number and I will call them back if there's any confusion. Inadequate communication. This day and age, leaving a voicemail on a pharmacist answering machine to me is the equivalent of having a carrier pigeon drop off the prescription. Illegible handwriting or ambiguities involving the medication name or directions for use. Yes, we probably process a couple hundred prescriptions a day and probably 15 a day are either handwritten or carried in. Illegible writing can be both a pharmacist and a physician thing as well. Inadequate procedures and techniques to ensure proper medication, prescription, repackaging, dispensing, administration, and monitoring. All of these, again, can be potentials for errors. Inadequate directions in patient education can result in a patient misuse. Take as directed. What does that mean? That means you are counting on that patient having an excellent memory and have paid attention very well to whatever the physician's instructions were. Professor Pete has some more wisdom I'd like to share with you today. Think about it. The most important information we transmit involves life and death. And when we transmit prescriptions, how do we do it? And 15 years ago, this is how we always did it. Before electronic prescriptions, which accounts for 90% of the prescriptions currently processed in the pharmacy that I staff, the doctors did the following. Okay, remember this. They took a quarter of a sheet of paper, right? They wrote it in Latin, a language with few exceptions no one speaks or writes. We always say, just take that PRN or Jim will take it PRN. What does PRN mean? It means pro renata. I even had to look up what pro renata meant in English, and it's translated for the thing born. Worse than that, we take these archaic abbreviations and we write them with very sloppy handwriting. So we abbreviate pro renata as PRN, and then we take a pen and we write very, very poorly with a most illegible signature. Did you ever sit and think for a minute or two? It's truly a wonder we don't have more errors with the way this data is transmitted, even with computers and obviously with handwritten prescriptions. So, 40 years, one of the things I started doing about 20 years ago when I decided I'd be teaching at St. Francis, I started saving bad prescriptions, and we're going to take a look at some and really analyze them. <clears throat> well, what's wrong with this prescription? Well, it says mix 2.5, 5PO, squiggle, mez. Hmm. Well, what that actually reads is methotrexate. So the first thing I teach my students when I show them this, do not use abbreviations. Do not use SS for sliding scale. Do not use MTX. Do not use uh, DPH. Do not use uh, PMDA. MTX, methotrexate, 2.5. That says dispense 25 tablets and five tablets once a week and refill one time. Poorly written, poorly prescribed, because I don't think methotrexate patients should ever have a refill. That's too long to be seen. They should have blood work done more frequently. Can you read this, Rx? Don't feel bad. I couldn't either. I had to call the doctor on this. Hmm, that top line. Wow. The second line, decatin, desitin. Hmm. Okay, top line, flexoril 10 milligrams, number 20, 1-P-O-T-I-D. That's not a 7. That's that guy's 1 without a dot over it. He just made it real quick. And then the other one was Motrin, 600 milligrams, dispense 30, and that's 1-P-O-Q-6-H every 6 hours. What's wrong with this prescription? Well, come on, Professor Pete. The handwriting's pretty good on it. 
Add bear, one inhalation twice a day. Start typing that out on your database. What's missing? That's right. There's no strength on it. So they did everything well, except for they have two refills on the first uh, part. And then it says label and refill one time. So is it one refill? Is it two refills? Is it add bear 100? Is it add bear 250? Or is it add bear 500? Again, a phone call. My students at St. Francis, one of the first years I taught on the evaluation, a student wrote back and said, Mr. Kreckle, you've taught us so much, but I don't think I could write a prescription to save my soul. And I said, I will fix that for you. So my students at St. Francis, I make them, after every lecture, write four prescriptions. And I tell them what I want them written on. I would say, write something like a Lama Laba or write something like a Laba ICS for an asthma patient. And they have to do everything perfect. And I said, my rule is if I have to call your clinic for clarification, you would lose a point for it. Some of my uh, currently practicing PAs, very much appreciated that. And the one in particular said to me, you know, Crackle, I hated those blank, blank, blank R exercises that you made us do. He says, but even with electronic prescribing, I'm better at it because I think of all the details. I think of the drug name. I think of the strength. I think of the SIG code. I think of the quantity. I think of the refills. And I think of the signature. Here's one of my all-time favorites. And again, in 40 years, you younger practitioners, don't worry, 40 years from now when you're sitting in this seat uh, doing a lecture like this, you'll have as much in your armamentarium as I do. What's wrong with this prescription? <clears throat> okay, take a good look at it. All right, nothing wrong with it, Crackle. It says Selma 350 dispense 161 POBID PRN. Do you need a little background on this? Let me give you a background story. This is great. I had a phone call at the pharmacy one day and they said, hi, uh, we need some help writing Roman numerals. and Roman numerals, yeah. I thought, oh, this is great. They're helping their kid with math homework. You remember in like fourth grade when you learned how to write Roman numerals? You know, the, the one, uh, like an I is a one, a V is five, X is 10, L is 50, C is 100. Okay, I remember all those. So I said, oh yeah, this is great. What number do you want to write? And he said, well, we want to write for 160. I said, oh, for 160. Well, let's see, C would be 100. Then you put an L after it, and then you would put an X after it. C, L, X, that would be 160. Oh, thank you very much, and to hang up the phone. Wasn't 15 minutes later, this prescription arrives to me, and it says Soma 350. They altered the prescription. And you see where the doctor originally wrote for 60, they just put a one in front of it. And you see where it says S-I-X-T-Y, they crossed that out and they put a C-L-X in it, you know, the Roman numeral abbreviation. So that would really fool me, the pharmacist. And we all know our doctors write in 80 days supplies. So I picked it up, called the physician, told him what went on. And he said, just invalidate the prescription and I'll take care of that patient next time I see them. The background story is what makes this prescription so entertaining. So let's take a look at the do not use list. Professor Pete teaches this to all of his PA students, and when they're writing their R exercises, this better not be in the SIG code. So do not use U for unit, because it can be mistaken as a zero, or the number four, or CCs. Write the word U-N-I-T. I-U, international units, can be mistaken for I-B, or the number 10. Right international unit. And we talked about QD, QD, Q dot, D dot, QD, QOD, QOD, Q dot, O dot, D dot, which can mean every other day. Of course, I had a doctor that used OD meaning once a day. Trailing zeros. You will see trailing zeros can cause a great source of confusion. If you ever want to alter a prescription, a trailing zero is a good way to do it. MS. We don't use abbreviations, right? It can mean morphine sulfate or magnesium sulfate. And your bowels will definitely know the difference. HS, is it half strength or horosomnia at bedtime? Again, write out the words at bedtime or half strength. Those little uh, alligators, those little arrows that mean open, uh, greater than or less than, I don't like them. And I always have to think those out. I've 
didn't do well with those in second grade, and I still have trouble thinking, is that bigger than or less than? They can be misinterpreted as the number seven, or in my case, probably confused for one another. Write out the words greater than or less than. You know, uh, use three units of Humalog if blood sugar is greater than 150. Write it out. Abbreviations for drug names, TCN, PCN, OTC, 5-FU or BMX, tetracycline, penicillin, orthotricycline, 5-fluorouracil or Benadryl, Maalox, xylocaine, also known as magic mouthwash. And they also can be misinterpreted due to similar abbreviations for multiple drugs. Again, write the names out. Apothecary units, yes, I used to have a doctor that would say give them three drams or two fluid drams four times a day. Do any of us even remember what drams are? Well, a fluid dram actually is 3.5 milliliters. Unfamiliar with many practitioners, anybody probably five years younger than me probably didn't even have apothecary units in school uh, and great confusion with metric units. Did you know with ounces, there's actually three different ounces. We have the Aberdupoy ounce, which is your trade ounce. We have an apothecary ounce and a troy ounce is what you use to measure gold. Avoid all of that confusion and use metric units only. Don't use that at symbol, an A with a circle around it. Write out the words AT. One of the things that they had to beat out of me when I started teaching at St. Francis was using CCs. We always use CCs rather than MLs. I think CCs are just faster to say. And uh, the lady that was in charge of me up at St. Francis, my didactic coordinator, said, anywhere where you have CC in your lecture notes, change it to ML. And so I've kind of been very vigilant with that because CCs can be mistaken for units of poorly written or two zeros. That little squiggly G sign micrograms can be mistaken for milligrams and result in a thousand fold overdose. Write out MCGs or micrograms. TIW can be misread as three times daily or twice weekly when it really means three times a week. SC or SQ can be misread as sublingual or five every. Write out sub-Q or subcutaneously. Again, avoiding these abbreviations is so important. DC, could it be discharge or discontinue? Write it out. ASAUAD can be misread as uh, right eye, left eye, or both eyes, or both ears, or both eyes, or right eye. Again, these need to be written out. The OS means oculus sinister. At one time, people that were left-handed were believed to be sinister or evil. So OS meant the sinister side, your eye that's on your sinister side, OS. Again, these should all be avoided. Uh, the slash can be misread as the numeral one. Uh, I had a doctor that used to, on refills, put two slashes. And many times his prescriptions were filled with 11 refills. Don't do that. Uh, pluses can be misread as a number four. Q6 PM can be misread as every six hours. Again, don't use X3D because that could be three doses or is it for three days? Even the SS with the bar on the top, is it 55 or is it sliding scale? And finally, IN can be misread as intravenous or intermuscular when you should write out the words intranasal. It's time for poll question number one. Which of the following agencies was established in 1975 to promote safe medication use and medication error prevention? Was it A, the United States Pharmacopeia, B, National Coordinating Council, C, the Institute for Safe Medication Practices, or D, the Department of Health and Human Services? Go in and key in your answer now. And the answer to poll question number one is answer C, the Institute for Safe Medication Practices, the ISMP, a very good resource for us community pharmacies to use because it has so many tips 
as far as avoiding errors. Well, let's look at some possible solutions to these dispensing errors. First of all, we can use both brand and generic names on prescriptions and labels. Think about that Uracite K versus KDOR. That would be very hard to confuse. But when we have potassium chloride versus potassium citrate, both of them being 10 milli equivalents, that can easily be confused. Including the purpose of the medication on a prescription. Take one tablet twice a day to help acidify the urine. That would be a good thing to put on the Uracite K. Configuring computer selection screens to prevent lookalike names from appearing consecutively. CELE20. Are we going to do Celexa20 or Celebrex20? Changing the appearance of lookalike product names to draw attention to their dissimilarities. And that's called tall man lettering. You kind of focus on the tall letters to help distinguish between, say, hydroxazine and hydralazine, another very common error. Barcoding is an excellent safety net, but the problem is using it. According to the federal law, prescription drug products, biological products, and over-the-counter medications commonly used in hospitals or dispensed pursuant to an order must contain a barcoded label. The FDA estimates that the barcode label requirements will prevent nearly a half a million transfusion errors and medication adverse events and save approximately $93 billion in health care costs over 20 years. Barcoding is a fabulous idea because instead of looking at words, we have a machine that's looking at numbers. I am a huge fan of barcoding. But as you know, I am a community pharmacist, so let's see what challenges there are with barcoding in the community pharmacy. Well, when we look at barcoding in the community pharmacy, we've got some challenges. And the biggest challenge all of us will know is frequent NDC changes because the warehouse changes generic manufacturers. And we have to do that to get the best deals for pharmacy. I wrote a letter for a national Drug Topics magazine, and we talked about the challenges with using all American products. I'll have patients come in and say to me, you know, I don't want anything from India. I don't want anything from China. I want only American-made stuff. And my challenge is this. Let's get reimbursed for our products at a reasonable rate, and we could maybe be a little bit more selective rather than always going with the cheapest possible brand. As reimbursements continue to be driven down, we need to become more and more savvy to find cheaper ways or less expensive ways of providing these pharmaceuticals to our patients. At the pharmacy that I staff at, at least 10% of the generics are a different brand than the last time I filled it, and that happens all the time. I would say on the average day, at least seven or eight national drug codes I change because we got something in from the warehouse that's a different manufacturer than we previously had. Has the new NDC been loaded into the database is a challenge that we'll have with our software vendor. Many times we will load up a national drug code and it's not in their database yet. Frequently, techs will bypass the barcoding due to manufacturer's changes rather than pull the label, redo the label, change the manufacturer, and do all that. A lot of times, it's just simply overridden because of the convenience of time savings. Always consult your pharmacist before overriding any barcoding because they can easily slip past the system. Even uh, the barcoding technology that we have I insist that my technicians use it to match barcodes. I've seen it even done with buprenorphine. 4-2 was written for, but an 8-2 was pulled, and I saw a technician override it. I said, what's the override for? Well, the thing beeped, and, you know, I had to override it. Why did you override it? It clearly says here 4-2, and you pull, uh, 4-1, and you pulled an 8-2 out of habit. Again, the pharmacist needs to be consulted before overriding any barcodes. Well, e-prescribing was going to be the godsend of, oh, about 15 years ago. We were going to have e-prescribing, and it was always fun talking to the people in academia about e-prescribing. I had uh, one older guy who worked at a university say, well, e-prescribing is going to 
virtually eliminate all the errors. I said, how's it going to do that? Well, it's real simple. You just click on a button and everything self-populates. I said to him, Jim, when was the last time you worked in a pharmacy? He said, well, I've never worked in one with a computer. I said, you might need to get to one. Of course, you have to type in the drug name. And of course, if the names don't match exactly of the patient, you have to type those in as well. There are lots of opportunities to make errors with e-prescribing. Although pharmacists are trained to verify unclear orders with the prescriber, electronic prescribing eliminates illegible handwriting. Hands down. I'll tell my patients, it's a typewritten prescription. There is nothing to argue here. We had a doctor that recently took all of his Norco 120 20 tablet prescriptions and changed them to 112. And he wants to see those patients every 28 days. And he said, we want 120. I said, the doctor wrote for 112. Oh, are you sure? Here it is. It's typewritten out. There is no arguing here at all as to whether it's a 112 or it's a 120. Most e-prescription software programs can also detect potential medication errors, such as possible drug allergy interactions, drug-drug interactions, and incorrect doses. And guess what? The prescribers can override those. I called a prescriber one day for an amlodipine 10 milligram and simvastatin 40 milligram drug interaction. Simvastatin under 20 milligrams shouldn't be a problem if the amlodipine say five milligrams. Well, I called and uh, expressed my concern, and she had her nurse call me back, and she read off to me uh, the nasty gram that she wrote that, you know, they have prescription software to catch this, and how dare we question them, and I've been in practice for 15 years, blah, 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 blah. But we even see that today with Eve prescribing. Anything, any safety feature, e prescribing can be overridden. According to the Healthcare Quality Modernization Act, Cost Reduction and Quality Improvement Act, automated prescribing can reduce prescribing errors as much as 95%. I will go on the limb to say for poor handwriting, and it can also decrease hospital costs by as much as 13%. So let's take a couple minutes and take a look at some e-prescribing. Remember, it's going to eliminate errors. We were told that. Let's look at some luck electronic prescribing errors. Electronic information for new prescription for this prescriber. Okay, here it is. It's clobetasol foam, 0.05%. Quantity, 30. That doesn't sound right. They're usually in 50 gram tubes. Oh, take one tablet by mouth three times a day, clobetasol foam. That's crystal clear writing. And it's crystal clear to me it wasn't double checked before it left the office. What is wrong with this prescription? Well, methyl check said, hey, that was easier to read than the last one, wasn't it? 32 tablets, two refills. Whew. Eight tablets a week subcutaneously. How are we going to draw up a tablet in a syringe? Obviously, they meant eight tablets every week by the oral route. And when you really look at this prescription, that's a four-week supply with two refills. That's 90 days. Uh, you can develop an anemia to methotrexate pretty quick. I would never put two refills on it. Well, Professor Pete, you did tell us that this e-prescribing was going to eliminate errors, right? Well, I didn't tell you that. That's what your government did. Let's take a look at these. Hey, Dulcolax stool softener, 100 milligrams. Use as directed the evening before the colonoscopy. Dispense four capsules. What's wrong with that? We all know what's wrong with that. We don't use Dulcolax stool softener. That takes at least two days to get through the system. That's dioctyl sodium sulfosuccinate. It's a stool softener. This is a beautiful example, a beautiful example of how this cross-branding, why it should be eliminated. Obviously, the doctor meant it to be Dulcolax tablets, which would have been the five milligram tablets, and taking four tablets an evening before a colonoscopy is not terribly uncommon. Again, cross-branding and a computer database are what contributed to this med error. And unfortunately, it was written by one of my students. And so I called her and said, hey, just want to tell you, pay a little closer attention to your database because it's goofy. She said, I typed in Dulcolax and that's the first thing that came up. Right. And I said, what you're looking for is the five milligram tablets. She made the correction and, of course, learned a lesson. All right, Professor Pete, you told us these typewritten prescriptions reduce errors. Let's look at another one, ampicillin 250. Take four capsules, one hour before dental procedure. What's wrong with that? There is a lot wrong with this prescription. Uh, the first thing that's wrong with it is it shouldn't be ampicillin. It should be amoxicillin. 
Amoxicillin is what you use for dental prophylaxis for endocarditis. Second thing, it's not 250 milligrams. It should be 500 milligrams. You take two grams of amoxicillin one hour before your dental appointment. So this prescription should be amoxicillin 500, dispense four capsules, take four capsules one hour before dental procedure. Yes, I did call the physician on this and he said, thank you very much for the catch. Go ahead, change it to amoxicillin 500 four capsules one hour before going to the dentist. Again, a medication error. And both of these require the pharmacist and the technician to really, really be paying attention. What is wrong with this prescription? This one comes from my daughter's practice in Morgantown, West Virginia. And we have a prescription for cholecalciferol vitamin D 2000 unit capsules. Dispense 90 and the patient is to take 2000 capsules by mouth once a day. Again, an error like this would never have occurred if the doctor was handwriting it. Would we have been able to read it is probably the question, but you can see obviously they meant 2,000 units or one capsule by mouth once a day. And do not fill this prescription the way that it's written. Rotigotine, 2 milligram, 24-hour transdermal patches. Place 30 patches on the skin once a day. Maybe we should make a rotigotine vest and slap 60 milligrams on the skin once a day. Obviously, the doctor meant one patch onto the skin once a day. We called and clarified it. Not to be that guy that's in class always clarifying and being a pain in the rear end. We did it to say, get your software fixed so that when you send out future refills, it's taken care of. They thanked us profusely and made the change. 11 states currently require e-prescribing for controlled substances. Pennsylvania law on electronic prescribing of controlled substances has been in effect since October 24th, 2019. That's a state I practice in. All e-prescribing mandates that all Schedule 2 through Schedule 5, so whether it's Percocet, or acetaminophen with codeine solution, controlled substances, except when dispensed or administered directly to a patient by a practitioner or authorized agent other than a pharmacist. We're always getting picked out, aren't we? To the ultimate user shall be prescribed electronically. This law replaces the traditional method of prescribing controlled substances to a patient by use of the typical prescription pads. So what are some problems with this? I see a lot of problems, and so did a lot of our clinicians that I talked to. First of all, smaller practices, especially dental offices, they might write two or three controlled prescriptions maybe a week. Um, and they're, I go to a dentist that's still using paper charts. They don't have the technology. So that's a problem. The second thing, how do you refuse an electronic prescription? There's no bounce back feature, as I like to call it. Let's say you are dead set against filling Subutex or buprenorphine, okay? And you get this prescription for Subutex sent to you for a 24-year-old male. And you just don't fill them. You don't even have it on your shelf. How do you bounce it back? That becomes just a whole nother dynamic as opposed to being handed a sheet of paper and saying, oh, hey, I'm sorry, sir. I don't stock buprenorphine eight milligram tablets, but I do have the eight two films with naloxone in them. Again, it's harder to bounce back. And my son-in-law, who's an expert with opioids, says what there should be, and we have the technology to do this, is almost like a cloud with, say, the name of Pete Crackle on it that I could go into a pharmacy and say, hey, I'm Pete Crackle. My date of birth is 52558. Uh, could you pull down my prescription that was sent? And then the pharmacist or the technician could pull it off of the cloud and then fill it. If the pharmacist saw something that he didn't like, he could tag it and say, uh, pull down prescription, check PDMP, refill too soon, and then send it back up that the patient could pick it up wherever. But you're kind of stuck with that prescription, aren't you, when it's sent to you electronically. The good news with them is it has greatly decreased forgeries. Uh, one of my colleagues that's on Operation Our Town here in central Pennsylvania, Matt Sassano, who works for the Pennsylvania Attorney General, says forged prescriptions have virtually been eliminated 
from my investigations. He said he no longer goes into the pharmacy, hangs out looking at prescription files, looking for forgeries. There just aren't any anymore. Well, another major stressor that contributes to errors without a doubt is workload. Work Workload will lead to errors as well, and since stress and an ever-increasing workload can contribute to medication errors, pharmacists should do everything within their power to ensure that their pharmacy is adequately staffed and that staff members have regular breaks. Scheduled breaks. Scheduled breaks are a must. I'm not saying grab a sandwich, stuff it in your face when you can. It's, I will take my lunch break from 12.20 till 12.30. Skippy can take his lunch break from 1 to 1.15. Susie can take hers from 1.30 till quarter to 2. A scheduled lunch break that the, page, that the worker is actually looking forward to. In a setting where the pharmacist does not directly determine staffing levels, and I'm sure that's every one of yours, it's always been my major battle, which is most pharmacies, unless you're the owner, you should communicate staffing needs and advocate for department policies that reduce stress and balance the workload for pharmacy staff. I have a saying, we need more staff and less yoga. You know, a lot of times they'll say, you know, to decrease your stress, you just need to do yoga or meditate. No, we need more help. And I think you should always be expressing that as well to your leaders. I have made a lot of noise about workload and stress as well as errors. Some of the drug chains and even some that have franchisees will do a 15-minute guaranteed. We advise don't do it. The National Coordinating Council for Medication Error Reporting and Prevention advocates the elimination of prescription time guarantees and a strengthened focus on clinical and safety activities of pharmacists within the community pharmacy setting. I remember early on in my career, the question was always, how much is it going to cost? Today is, how long is it going to take? The council acknowledges that many issues, including patient satisfaction and current reimbursement model, under which a pharmacist is only paid for dispensing product volume. That's the big focus. Get them in, get them out. We need to encourage a focus on prescription safety rather than prescription volume and the speed at which the community pharmacy dispenses prescriptions needs to be tempered with safety. However, this can have detrimental effects on patient education and patient safety. How many times do we say, I just don't have time to go over and counsel that patient on that antibiotic? Pharmacists may feel compelled to bypass critical safety checks or offer insufficient counseling in order to meet prescription volume quotas or time promises. Do not do the 15-minute guaranteed. The NCCMERP says don't do it. Technology, well, is it a blessing or is it a curse? We have a saying, to err is human, but to really screw things up requires a computer. And this is my last favorite prescription to look at. Attends, breathable briefs, large. Dispense 72 with a refill. Take one pill by mouth three times a day for a month. I don't think we want anybody jamming an attends brief into their mouth. Along with staffing, we need to create a positive work culture, and I know those things are very congruous. The more staffing you have, the more pleasant it is to work, and the more positive the work culture is. Pharmacists should work to create a department culture and policies and procedures that reduce the risk for medication errors. This includes training all staff to clarify any unclear information, double-checking all prescriptions before and after filling. And I tell my text this, if you see something you don't like, you come and see me immediately. I always will be glad to explain to you what I'm doing, why I'm doing, and I will be forever grateful for you if you catch an error that I might have made. Verifying patient identity and allergies with each prescription and providing patient counseling before dispensing any medication, especially if it's a new medication. Almost 80% of errors can be caught with patient counseling simply 
by reading the label to the patient, especially those prednisone tapers. Read those prednisone tapers. I'll even go so far as print out on the internet a calendar, like say for June, and then I will write the directions three daily for three days, two daily for three days, one daily for three days. Read it to the patient, hand them a calendar, and if there is an error, I'm guaranteed with that calendar, you're going to catch it. I have written frequently in national magazines about staffing formulas. I got a call once from a hospital pharmacist in Butler, PA, which is about three hours from where I practice. And he said, you seem to be the national expert. I type in community pharmacy staffing and your name comes up all over the place. Help me out with some staffing issues that I have. And I was glad to do it. There's different formulas. Uh, one grocery chain uses the number of prescriptions per day divided by the number of hours divided by 8.7, including cashiers. So let's say you're filling 280 prescriptions in 12 hours. Do the math, you're going to get 23.3 staffing hours. Another grocery store chain says it's the number of prescriptions per day divided by the number of hours staffed divided by 11, but they don't include their cashier. So you fill 280 prescriptions in a shift in 12 hours, you get 25 hours of staffing. You get about the same no matter how you do it, including the cashier or not. That Formula One, that chain is really cool. They do a block rotation, a four block rotation where they'll say, okay, we have four techs or two techs and two cashiers, and they rotate them. Uh, one will be doing data entry, one will be doing telephone, one will be doing cash register, one will be doing the filling, and they will rotate every two hours so nobody gets tired. I like that because then you have everybody that's really adequately trained. Formula two, uh, they're not quite so uh, rambunctious as far as telling uh, their technicians where they need to be. Generally, their cashiers will stay on the cash register all day, and their techs will be stuck either doing data entry all day or doing prescription filling all day. So what are the problems with a staffing formula? My contention is at least they're using something. It's not some guy in some back room saying, yeah, they got enough help. At least they've got numbers they can look at. So the problems with those staffing formula that I shared with you, they don't account for those difficult prescriptions that are more intense. They require more intense counseling. So you fill a lisinopril 10, one tablet once a day is a refill versus Amoxicillin clavulanate 600 slash 5. Well, you're going to give that prescription a lot more care than you would the lisinopro one. You're going to care for both of them, but it takes a lot more attention. Well, first of all, it's going to need reconstituted when the patient arrives. Are we going to provide a dosing syringe and demonstrate that to the mom? We're going to discuss storage requirements and administration. You're going to give the kid, you know, four and a half milliliters twice a day with food. Keep it in the refrigerator. Here's what the syringe looks like. Shake it well before you use it. It expires in 10 days. Oh, and also, before you give your kid the first dose of this medication, since they're in diapers, make sure you're using a protective ointment on the baby's butt to prevent any diaper rash from occurring. Make sure you give it with food. For, to decrease stomach upset. Make sure you have a spoon with a little bit of chocolate syrup on it. Give the kid the medication. Give them the chocolate syrup to take care of the foul taste. That takes a whole lot longer than saying, here's your lisinopril refill. Thank you and have a nice day. It also doesn't account for difficult patients who require more of the one-on-one -on -one time. And I don't mean difficult in a pejorative way. Filling the lisinopril, here it is. Have a nice day. You get your new diabetic that gets an insulin prescription and you're giving them test strips and you're giving them syringes or pen needles and you're giving them the lancets and you're giving them a new blood glucose meter and you're setting all that up, that takes a lot more time than that one lisinopril prescription. And the truth is you give that kind of care to your patients, they're going to come back to you and frequently they bring their friends. We've been talking about pharmacists and technicians for a while as far as what we can do to prevent errors. Our patients are the ones that should have some skin in the game as well, so let's see what our patients can do to help us. Patients should educate themselves regarding common types of medical errors, commonly implicated drugs such as warfarin as well as insulin. 
Patients should know the names of all of their medications, quit snickering, and they should know the names of them, what they take them for, and why they're taking them. According to one study, half, 50% of patients do not take their medications as prescribed. Patients should make sure that they read and understand all directions for taking their medications safely. Patients should never assume that their primary doctor, pharmacist, and specialist are aware of all the prescription and over-the-counter medications and supplements that they're taking. Think levothyroxine. You need to know if that patient is taking a vitamin supplement that has dye and trivalent cations in. Are they taking something with magnesium or calcium or manganese in it? Patients should keep an updated list of all of their medications and their supplements that they are taking and reconcile it with their healthcare providers at each visit. Patients should never assume that the medication is safe or appropriate just because it was prescribed. They should always ask for clarification if they have any doubt on the safety or the efficacy of their medications. Patients should always feel that your pharmacy is an open door to knowledge. They should always feel comfortable asking you questions. When they call me with, a, gee, I was taking a white pill and now it's a pink oblong pill. Is this right? I tell them, I want you to call because the last thing I would ever want you to do is take a medication that might have been dispensed in air. Although we have barcoding and although we have a lot of technology to ensure safety, it can happen. Without a doubt, pharmacy technicians are the greatest asset that any pharmacy can have. I'm going to talk about two of my favorite pharmacy technicians. They were on both ends of the spectrum when it comes to data entry. Darlene hired her in 1984. That's back when we had three-part claim forms that were written in pen. And 10% of our patients were third-party and 90% were cash. I worked alongside of her for 24 years. When I hired her, she was 39 years old. Darlene was highly organized. She was a hard worker. She had great communication skills. People loved her. She was very accurate. And I referred to her as my guard dog. She didn't refer anyone to me if it's a problem that she could handle. Her quote would always be, he's busy now. Is there something I can help you with? Brad, my superstar technician, I've written about him in lots of my articles as well. Brad, amazing computer skills. Hired him as a high school kid, worked with him at Thompson Pharmacy until I left there in 2020. Brad did pharmacy data entry like no other. I have never met another Brad. I have amazing techs where I'm working with now, but they're not quite Brad's yet. Brad, Brad had amazing accuracy with his data entry. He handled most of the problems so I could counsel patients. His uh, tagline was also, he's busy. What can I do to help you? I'm in front of my computer now. What do you need? If it was a question about therapeutics, Brad always referred them to me. But Brad took care of so many of those things so I could be a pharmacist doing therapeutics. So let's talk about minimizing interruptions. You want to train the techs and techs, many of you that are listening to this already know, you get the, may I speak with a pharmacist? Well, may I ask who's calling is a good response. If it's a physician, of course, they go through immediately. Most questions can be answered by looking up a patient on the pharmacy software. Did the doctor send in my prescription yet? You're probably the one that processed it. Is my prescription ready? How much is my prescription? What time do you close? You know that option that says to see what our closing times are, press three. They never press three. They're going to press zero so they can talk to someone. Or I need to call in my prescription numbers. Now, is it okay for me to have alcohol with my lisinopril? That's a question for the pharmacist. Minimizing interruptions to the pharmacist is critically important. Well, Let's interrupt the pharmacists and the technicians with poll question number two. According to studies, what percent of patients take their medication incorrectly? Is it 17% of the time they take it incorrectly, 32% of the time, 50% of the time, or 68% of the time? Go ahead and key in your answers now.
One of the reasons that we need to significantly cut down on interruptions because interruptions equal mistakes. A total of 5,072 prescriptions were analyzed with 164 errors detected for an overall error rate of 3.23%. If we multiply that times 1.5 million, that is a significant problem. Wrong label information was the most common type of error. 80% of the errors detected. Most label errors involved incorrect instructions to the patient, 46% of the time. Incorrect position, 18% of the time. Wrong number of refills, 8% of the time. Or just miscellaneous errors, 28% of the time. Well, someone had some time and they did a study on interruptions and distractions. The definition that they use for an interruption is cessation of a productive activity before the current prescription filling task was completed for any externally imposed observable or audible reason. There was a total of 2,022 interruptions detected affecting 1,143 prescription sets. The error rate for prescription sets with one or more interruptions was 6.65%. The error rate for 1,551 uninterrupted prescription sets was 5.67%. So you can see uh, uninterrupted, they did a little bit better. As far as a distraction goes, and they also discuss distractions, and we might use the word interruption or distraction the same, but they actually have it at... Uh, pretty well delineated. A distraction was defined as a stimulus from a source external to the pharmacist that was not followed by cessation of activity, but by the pharmacist continuing the productive efforts while responding in a manner that was observable. There were a total of 2,457 distractions that were detected for 1,329 prescription sets. The error rate for prescription sets with one or more distractions was 6.55%. There was an error rate of 1,365 prescriptions with none were 5.64%. So interruption or not, you still had 5.64% error rate. So minimizing distractions and interruptions is important but it only really accounted in this study for about 1%. When we're talking about interruptions, are there any more interruptions in a pharmacy that we have more than telephones? I have this theory, and I wish everybody in the world would follow it, and I wish every state board of pharmacy would implement the Kreckle rules. You should not have more phone lines in your pharmacy than the number of available staff to answer them, minus the pharmacist. If you have two technicians, you should only have two active phone lines. Pharmacist, and I know, quit snickering, should never pick up a phone because it's ringing. Pharmacists should only answer phone calls that, are, that have been triaged and transferred to them. Call your doctor's office someday and see if he answers the phone. Always pull up a patient by date of birth. The reason that I insist on that is you won't have to clarify the spelling of the last name. My name's Crackle. Go ahead and spell it. Did you spell it L-E? That's wrong. K-R-E-C-K-E-L is how I spell it. So if you type in my date of birth, you're going to get the last name spelt correctly. How do you spell Tanasia? T apostrophe N-A-S-I-A. Is your computer software putting that apostrophe in? Or is it not? Or did you spell Tanasia, T-E-N or T-O-N or T-A-N? That's why dates of birth are critically important. Don't talk to me without a patient name or a date of birth written down. And it's good to check to see if it really is the patient. If they hesitate to give you the correct date of birth, it might be a red flag. Let's say you know your buddy is on Suboxone and you knew he was going to the clinic today because you're good buddies. I'm going to call the drugstore. I'm going to see if I can pick that prescription up. Uh, hi, this is Bill Smith. Did my Suboxone prescription get sent over yet? Give me your date of birth. Um, it's uh, um, June. June. Tw you immediately know by the way he answers that question, 
that could be a red flag. Ask me what my date of birth is. I'm going to tell you that it's May 25th and the year. So it is really important to ask that date of birth at every encounter. When a patient calls in and says, hey, I'd like you to get my prescriptions ready and I don't have my numbers, I need your date of birth, please. Oh, okay. It's June 27th, 2015. Oh, okay. And then I can go ahead, key it up, and fill the prescriptions for the kid. We've been talking about when errors occur and what to do about them. Let's really laser focus on our response to when errors happen. Well, first of all, nobody's perfect. Nobody should ever be punished for reporting such an error. According to my estimates, I've probably verified one and a half million prescriptions in my 40-year career. Have I made mistakes? Yes. And I can probably remember every single one of them. You need to do this when it happens. Log exactly what happened. And it should be kept in a computer software database or a designated binder. It should be its own dedicated piece of information. What should be logged down is the patient's name and their date of birth. The date the incident occurred, the time and the level of staffing. Well, let's see, it was 5.30 in the afternoon. My two techs went home. I had a cashier and I had a prescription for potassium citrate and it was filled with potassium chloride. Do you see what could have happened there? The name of the medication. Well, what was written was potassium citrate. It was filled with chloride. Name of the pharmacist and who verified it? Who did the data entry? It might have happened three or four days ago. The pharmacist might have verified it when it went into the system, but it was too early to fill. The name of the technician who processed the prescription. Was any harm done? Well, the guy brought the prescription back. How was it reconciled? We apologized and dispensed the right medication. Again, document all of this. And what can be done to prevent future errors? Maybe you make it a policy that on your potassium citrate, you write your site K in the instructions. We also have some other databases where these prescription errors can be reported. The FDA has its own database, and I have the link to it there. And the Institute for Safe Medication Practices, the ISMP, also has a database as well. All healthcare professionals, that is all of us, whether you're a physician, a dentist, a physician assistant, nurse practitioner, a nurse, or a pharmacist, all healthcare professionals need to report medication errors resulting in harm in any of the following. Any errors in prescribing, dispensing, administering, transcribing, or monitoring of medications and vaccines, any of those need to be reported to the ISMP. Errors involving administration of incorrect medication or wrong strength or dose of a medication need to be reported. Errors involving the administration of a drug to the wrong patient. Errors involved in confusion over drugs that look alike, sound alike, or have similar packaging. And remember, you know, we talked about some of those medication errors with Razodyne or Reminil versus Amaryl. Those should have never even gotten through the FDA. And when these reports are made frequently enough, it seems that the ISMP are the ones that report that to the FDA. And maybe we can change the name of something like LOSEC-20 to Prilosec-20. Errors involving dosage calculation or medication preparation. Why is it that on those antibiotics that are reconstituted, do they have the number of milliliters to be added, 68 milliliters, in such a small font. Why can't it say reconstitute with 68 mils, you know, in 20-point font? Errors involving the incorrect method or route of administration. Errors involving the misuse of medical equipment. All of these need to be reported to the ISMP, and maybe we can decrease proactively these medication errors. The final checkout, your cashiers, even though some of them are not pharmacy technicians, you need to drill into their heads. You need to always verify the date of birth. If someone else is picking up the medication for a patient, you need at least a secondary identifier, like an address, whatever, to be sure that you or the cashier has given the right person the right medication. Again, we pharmacists behind the counter that are filling prescriptions, this is one error that we cannot prevent. 
Secondary identifiers are really important in the drive through You know the drive throughs with those bad microphones? And you'll say, uh, could you tell me your name? Oh, I think she said Betty Smith. And that's why dates of birth are so important to be able to use a secondary identifier, especially in the drive through And how many of us are staffing drive throughs where you don't even see the patient unless they're on a camera? So not only medication safety, but it's also a HIPAA violation. If you give uh, Bob Smith uh, Jim Jones's Viagra, he might know him. And again, that needs to be reported as a HIPAA violation. Yes, even more paperwork. I have been for years talking about medication errors. I have for years uh, preached about medication safety. And here are some articles that I have, and I'm going to go through those real briefly. It'd be a little bit of supplemental reading for you that might help you in your quest to decrease the amount of medication errors that you have. I've written articles uh, under Drug Topics is the name of the magazine. Just use these links. The Red Pen Rules started out as a story from one of my patients that I saw at the clinic. And Dr. Gates says, you need to go in and talk to her. She's a pharmacist and she's really struggling. So I went in and she said, I work for a major chain and I have so much trouble verifying prescriptions. I know how to do it, but I just obsess and I obsess and I obsess. And I said, well, you know, it could be very well a psychological issue. Maybe it could be obsessive compulsive disorder. And we know to treat that with uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. I said, but tell me what happens. So I told her what my method is. I have a red pen. And the rule is when Pete Crackle has a red pen in his hand, you are not to talk to me. You know, I don't even like you looking at me when I have a red pen in my hand. I can feel that you're just waiting for me. So the red pen in my hand means you keep away and you do not talk to me. I'm verifying a prescription. So I will circle the patient name or the date of birth. I'll circle the drug in the drug chain. I'll underline the directions that were typewritten in. That allows me to know that I already checked that prescription. Oh, gosh, did I verify? Yes, I did. And then on the receipt, I circled the national drug code. And if the NDC doesn't match the bottle that's in front of me, I then take a look and I will circle, not the NDC, but I'll circle, you know, the drug strength on it so that I know with a red circle that I verified it. And I also know to make sure that that drug that the NDC didn't match because we just got a new brand of lisinopril 20 milligrams in goes over on the counter and then I change it in the computer system so that future prescriptions do match. Also, taking a stand on pharmacy tech staffing levels, I believe that this is something that the state boards of pharmacy should address. The state board of pharmacy should provide minimum staffing levels. They should say for every nine prescriptions filled in an hour, you have to have a tech. And if you don't, you get reported to the state board for that. There are ways that we can greatly reduce these errors by having adequate staffing. Another concern of mine, time for FDA action. This was my story about the amitriptyline 10 versus the amitriptyline 100 milligram. And I knew this lady very, very well. Uh, I wasn't practicing at that site at the time, but she was greatly distressed because of it. And she has suffered irreparable damage because of it. She's not able to practice her trade anymore because of that error. And again, if it would have said AMIT, 100 milligrams on it, it would not have been a problem. The FDA needs to step up. Well, in the years that I've written that article, they haven't come a call in yet. Another one, workflow, staffing, phone lines, and drive throughs I hate drive throughs the only time I've liked drive throughs is in the middle of any kind of a pandemic. It's nice that they're on the other side of the glass. But again, when we had our drive through the first year, I was talking to a pharmacist, I believe he was from down south, and he said, that is its own cashier. You should never have somebody say, oh, you cover this register and the drive through That's its own area. So phone lines, again, my belief that we should never have more phone lines active than the number of technicians able to pick them up and talk to them. There is no reason to pick up a phone if, for a pharmacist because you don't have enough staffing. You should be able to kill a phone line. And finally, my last uh, tirade 
color-coded inhalers. I'm sure many of you that have listened to my presentations before know that eye drops are color-coded. If you use atropine and anything in the atropine line, red caps. If you take an antibiotic eye drop, they have brown caps. If you are on a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory eye drop, they have gray caps. If you are on a prostanoid, they have teal colored caps. So the color of the cap is the mechanism of action. Why can't we do that for inhalers? You think about rescue, anything rescue, what color comes to mind? Yeah, that's right, red. Red fire trucks, red fire hydrants, red fire extinguishers, emergency, red. So what color are your rescue inhalers? Well, if it's Vendel and it's gray, if it's Provendal, it's yellow. If it's uh, one of the rescue inhalers that are generics, they can be white. I have seen them all different colors. If the light blue ones are Zopinex, why aren't they all red? And why can't we have the long-acting muscarinic antagonists all be green? So when you say to a patient, I want you to use that green inhaler every morning. And if somebody is having trouble breathing, you know that it's the red one is the rescue inhaler. Why is Anoro red? It's not a rescue inhaler. Again, the FDA stepping in and color coding these things would greatly assist our patients in time of emergency. All right, I want to thank you for listening to this presentation on medication errors. We all have a lot of work we can do. We as pharmacists can do a whole lot to decrease the number of errors. People that are managers can make sure that we have adequate staffing to decrease errors. And our pharmacy technicians can always be pay paying attention and helping us decrease the number of errors. So I'd like you to type in any questions or comments that you have in the chat box now. Thank you for joining me for this presentation.